time, we'll put this recording teaching for 20 years, having completed her CELTA and diploma in education. And then after working as a supply teacher in the UK for five years, she taught TEFL in Canada, the UK and Italy. She started out her career as a history teacher, but then, uh, as she says, quickly fell in love with a fascinating problem of teaching and learning languages. During her time in the UK, she taught in many summer schools and later became a director of studies of a language school in Bristol for a few years. She's been working at Monash College in Melbourne in Australia since 2008 and during this time has been an IELTS examiner, IELTS teacher, EAP teacher, assessment writer, curriculum developer and most recently teacher developer. She loves teaching English, currently has an enthusiasm for growth mindset and cognitive load theory and the best part of the job she says is helping both the students and the teachers to get the best out of themselves so that's great so over to you Gabby thank you hello hello world um thank you so much for showing an interest in reading skills um I think reading skills is an area where um that could do with some development uh in EAP so it's great that you uh have made the effort to tune in today um so this talk is going to be about teaching reading skills with two strategies. Um, the first one is uh, my own adaptation of point evidence and example known as PEE. -E. Uh, and the second one, which we'll look at in the second half of the talk, is uh, KWL, which is what I know, what I want to know, uh, and what I learned. And I'll come back to KWL later. So I think uh, it's important when we think about teaching reading uh, that we try and go beyond comprehension questions in our reading lessons. Uh, and in fact, um, in Peter Watkins' recent uh, Teaching and Developing Reading Skills book, he says um, that the materials designed to promote reading uh, tend to be dominated by question types that test factual comprehension. Uh, focusing on finding explicit information and the, the correct response, which is, of course, a focus on um, not a focus on process, but a focus on product. And then he, he goes on to say that um, comprehension questions have a place, uh, but they don't in and of themselves teach reading. And I think that agrees with what uh, Leckie was writing back in 1993. Um, in fact, Leckie said that um, sometimes seeing uh, texts as linguistic artefacts can even engender poor reading skills. So reading lessons need to promote authentic responses. I think before people read, during and after uh, reading. So um, that's why it's useful to know strategies like PEE and KWL. Um, EAP generally, has a, a cognitive approach to reading. So most of our syllabuses and textbooks tend to look at skimming and scanning, looking for the main idea, uh, gist, guessing meaning from context. Um, many of these are testable. Uh, and so they were incorporated into the IELTS test. Uh, and, and it's just important to remember that there is a difference between teaching reading and testing reading. And as someone who taught IELTS for many years, I think it is, if students are doing, preparing for IELTS or PTE, it is really important that we prepare them for the tests. But when we're teaching EAP, we're trying to teach a much broader set of skills, particularly if we're doing pre-sessional undergraduate and, and postgraduate bridging courses. So we have to bear in mind that teaching and testing reading um, are not exactly the same thing. So, um, looking for the main ideas is what heading matching uh, questions are traditionally based on. Um, so in order to help students with heading matching questions, you actually have to think about what is summarising. Uh, so it's important uh, when we're looking at what is summarising that we, uh, that a reader can recall and understand the main points of a text. Uh, so you should be able to sequence text and 
retail a text in their own words. And at the point where you're retelling a text in your own words is the point where you're moving into more of a, a higher order thinking skill rather than just um, with comprehension questions, locating details in a text. Um, and when you can sum up the most important ideas, you're making some sort of analysis. Uh, and again, it, it's more of a, a higher order skill. So um, I think unless students can find main ideas efficiently, um, I think students will find critical thinking in L2 challenging. So these strategies are going to help students to find uh, the, the main ideas efficiently, which gives them more sort of space on their hard drive, if you like, for being able to express uh, the critical ideas. Right, so let's look at what point evidence example is. Um, so we've got the, um, I've made it into a hamburger. So it's a sort of friendly, um, friendly kind of format. Um, and then maybe it helps st students, uh, younger students too, to sort of understand that it, a paragraph is made up of, of different parts. We've got the, the point, which you can also call the main idea, the topic sentence. It doesn't really matter what you call it as long as you're consistent. Otherwise, students tend to get a bit confused in courses. Um, so, you know, if you're going to call it, um, someone I observed today was doing me, M-E-E -E, instead of point, I guess they didn't want to confuse the students. So point, P, me, some people use topic sentence, T, it doesn't really matter, but we've got point, Evidence and explanation or example. So you're getting the students to see that you can often divide paragraphs into these three um, different parts. So let's see how that works with a paragraph. Now this paragraph I took from um, healthline.com. It's a nutrition magazine. So I adapted it. I've simplified uh, some of the vocabulary because I think if, you, if you're teaching students who are IELTS 4.5 or IELTS 5, 5.5, and you're trying to teach them something like paragraph structure, I think if the, if the vocabulary is challenging, they'll get distracted and they'll start trying to look everything up in their dictionaries and then they might not, the teaching point might get a bit lost. So I think it's really important to either work with a topic that you've used before so that you're recycling vocabulary or a text that's not too uh, linguistically difficult for the purposes of teaching structure. Um, so we can see we've got the yellow is the P. Uh, if you eat too much added sugar, um, it will have a negative impact on your brain health. And this bit, you're at the risk of diseases is actually the link from the previous paragraph. And then we've got the E, um, the, which is in this case, the evidence because we've got research. Research has shown that a diet with lots of sugar results in a bad memory, smaller brain volume, specifically in the part of the brain that is your working memory, also known as the short-term memory. So that's the evidence. And then the example is very easy for the students to find because it says, for example, right? But, so yes, you can start with something simple. And if you actually look at the original text that I took this from, um, the, the authentic text is all structured as, as PEE. So it, it is quite a common, way to structure things. And in fact, it's taught in secondary schools as a writing tool, but it, I've adapted it as a reading tool um, because I think for students um, who want to find, to make a summary, they need something very clear and very simple, like a sort of framework that they can work with. So here I've, uh, I've put the PEE into what we call a, a graphic organiser. You don't have to put it into a graphic organiser. You could just get students to um, highlight paragraph in groups or individually. Uh, if you are lucky enough to have uh, laptops or devices, they can do it on Google Docs in groups or as individuals, or you can get them to fill in a table. So if you are gonna use a table and you're using color, I would recommend uh, that you stick to the same colors so that the P or the T is always yellow. 
the evidence and explanation is always green and the example is always blue. Because for visual people, that can be very confusing if you change the colours. Um, so yes, so you get the students to write in the boxes um, and that's very easy outcome for you to measure. If they're doing it on a piece of paper, you can walk around the classroom and see that they can find that. If it's on a, a, doc, on a laptop or a Google Doc, again, you, it's easier for you to measure. Now, um, yeah, I think for learners that are 4.5 to 5.5, um, because it's super simple, P is super simple, it reduces the cognitive load. Because what you really want them to do is to be able to distinguish between what is the point and what is everything else. So between sort of 4.5 to 5.5 or B1, that's all you're looking for. You just want them to be able to find the point. If they can get into a sort of heated discussion about whether it's evidence or explanation, then you can sort of measure that outcome and say, oh, great, they've really understood because they're now thinking, oh, is this evidence or is this explanation? Um, so they've understood it for the purposes, for your purpose, which is either to scaffold towards writing a, a summary or to write um, heading, to do heading matching questions. Now, if you happen to be teaching a postgraduate bridging course, pre-sessional course or undergraduate, you may prefer to use um, TEAL, which is the topic sentence evidence and explanation example and then the link, because obviously when you simplify things, you lose a bit of the, the complexity. And if you're dealing with peer reviewed material, that might not work so well. Um, so for sort of IELTS six and above, you might like something a bit more complex. A lot of teachers where I work, uh, they quite like to put another column to the right with sources. So if students are doing a pre-sessional bridging course and they have to find, they have to fill in the boxes, then they also have to fill in um, in the green section or the, the blue section, they have to fill in the sources as well. Uh, and again, that's very easy to measure walking around or on a laptop. Okay, so let's look and see how we would use um, this to teach. We'll go back from pre-sessional bridging courses back to teaching IELTS or um, as with our courses, it might be that you, you, you need to prepare your students for their EAP reading test. Heading matchings are a very popular type of question. Uh, they're very practical, they're easy to um, mark. Uh, so they're, they're used in a lot. So the way I think is best to do it is you've got a paragraph like this one. Uh, so this one is about housing. Um, everyone has a stake in housing, including those with disabilities, uh, those who are elderly or can't walk. That's the background bit. Um, with the number of new communities and housing developments being planned in Britain, Councils, developers and builders should consider accessibility as a fundamental design principle. Okay, um, it's clear that the lack of accessibility in new houses not only has a negative impact on personal independence, it can have a knock-on of negative effect in terms of social inclusion, employment, maintaining good physical and mental health. As such, accessibility needs should be taken into account when houses are being built. So in my mind, maybe I, the whole week's topic was on housing and buildings. I wouldn't just bring a random topic in. Um, and then I've written some uh, called distractors. There's one answer that's correct and the rest are distractors. And I would give maybe a, students in pairs, like they have this um, and they need to, uh, to, to choose the heading that they think, well, first of all, they need to put the PEE, mark it up for PEE. And then when they've decided what the P is, so it should look like this. Right, so they've marked up the P and the E, and then we've got a bit of background. Then they have to look at each one of these uh, distractors and decide whether or not it matches the yellow part that they've identified. Um, and if it doesn't, then they know by process of elimination that that's probably not the answer. Because obviously with heading matching, the problem is not just that they have to summarise. I mean, that's basically what they have to do is the first step, but they then have to choose a paraphrase. So heading matching is also about paraphrase, which is an extra degree of difficulty to students who don't have a lot of depth of vocabulary. Right, so then they, the students can choose which answer they think it is and then compare with their partner, see if they've got the same answers or not, do some peer checking, 
And then because I'm not aiming to have this take any more than 10 minutes out of my lesson because I've got a packed syllabus to teach, I would probably um, put my own answer up on the board and then I would get them to um, the, all the, why each one is wrong. Like for example, everyone a stakeholder, that's background. Um, the answer is number two. And then social inclusion are important. The words are all in the text, but it's not actually the answer. Houses should be designed by councils. Again, it doesn't say that in the actual text. If you read it, the words are there. And then number five is just a, a mishmash, mishmash of um, vocabulary from the, uh, the text. So, so yes, so it's good that if students do this little and often. However, of course, I'm probably thinking, but all paragraphs are not that simple. Um, so, but I still think once you've given students a strategy, especially students that are weak at, at reading, it's, it's still going to help them with a paragraph like this, which is quite challenging. So, yeah, time is getting on. So I'll, so if we look at the, this one actually comes from one of Cambridge's books, um, Cambridge Academic English, it's the upper intermediate book. And you can see that the, it's mainly um, evidence or explanation, sorry, and then just a couple of, a little bit of point, of point or topic sentence. But I think if what you do, because some IELTS paragraphs or EAP are quite difficult like this one, is you slowly increase the degree of difficulty. So you're doing maybe one or two paragraphs in class every day, spending 10 or 15 minutes, just helping students to automatise that process of identifying the point, the evidence, the example, deciding what the point is, looking at the paraphrases and um, getting more and more and more confident with it and you slowly make the paragraphs more and more and more difficult until they can manage much harder stuff. Um, it's not just for IELTS, I believe the PTE exam, students also have to summarise a written text of 300 words in one sentence and they have 10 minutes to do that. Um, they don't have to choose the paraphrase, but they still need to use the strategy like PEE in order to, particularly if they're not confident readers, to help them try and identify what the, the point is so that they can paraphrase that point. And I think it's really important if you are training students for high stakes exams to remember that automatisation is really important to be able to perform under test conditions. If that's not something you've done lots and lots and lots, once you get into a stressful situation, it will all fall apart. So it's it's good to train little and often. Um, so you can write your own heading matching distractors for your students, um, but uh, or you can get them to write their own for themselves. But that is quite time consuming. So I'm not aiming for this to take up a lot of the lesson. I just spoke about that before. Okay, so if we go back to a simple paragraph like this. Uh, it's not difficult to write different distractors for it. I'll move on to KWL tables because I realise time is uh, running out. So I think with PEE, um, an awareness of how texts are organised is a really important part of a reader's ability to comprehend it. And PEE is a super simple way of, of introducing that. Um, I think with, if, if we're talking about training students for things like heading matching or PTE, I think little and often, is the key to helping them build their summarising skills. Uh, and I think also graphic organisers will help uh, learners and colour as well to make sense of, of reading. So it's good to have a range of, of strategies. Okay, so let's move on to look at KWL because there is actually a connection. Now, higher order thinking skills um, are really important um, they should be embedded in the process of English language teaching and learning. So obviously if we think about those comprehension questions, um, there's not so much higher order thinking involved in locating details, but at the point where you're retelling a text and then you're analysing it, you get higher order thinking skills coming out in the task. So empirical evidence suggests that teaching critical thinking skills has a positive impact on learning. Um, so this is Bloom's revised taxonomy. So you can see that level one, remembering, we've got memorise, recall, repeat, 
And um, with KWL, I uh, hope to sort of move up to uh, looking at applying, we'll talk about that a little bit. So um, this is Dr. John Langra, an Australian um, expert on teaching and learning. So he says, um, to learn the three C, critical, creative and curious thinking, students need to develop essential mental attitudes and mindsets that are used in these types of thinking. Uh, thinking by ourselves is hard mental work. So we need to develop some positive attitudes. So I think, yes, because it's hard work, that's why I think these things are like KWL or PE is, is helpful. Um, I've looked at a few studies on KWL tables um, and a lot of the peer reviewed research suggests that they work quite well. So just to remind you, uh, KWL is what I know, what I want to know, and what I learned. Okay, so it's really important that students, when they read an academic text, they ask themselves, why am I reading this text and what do I want to know? Uh, especially if they're doing research for pre-session or bridging course. Um, and if we go back to Leckie's work, she says, you know, you need to, that separation between reading and writing is quite artificial. Um, so students need to do something with what they've read, make a group presentation, Minimal, minimally have a discussion, maybe reflect on it using an app like Flipgrid. If you're familiar with it, it's quite handy to use. Um, or maybe write, using their summary to write a reflection. Um, so an example would be like first year university textbooks often have revision questions at the end of every section. So this is content books. So we're talking about business, textbook, maybe managerial communication. Um, and so if you're teaching your undergraduate pre-sessional students how to read a subject textbook, uh, you can look at revision questions and you can put those into what do I want to know on your KWL table. So this is your KWL table. We've got, if you look at the top, we've got the review question, uh, which for this business course is, a uh, business English course is identify what's involved in managing a downsized workplace. And then we've got the table uh, with what do I know? So it's eliciting from the student's own knowledge. What do I know about downsizing? Uh, people lose their jobs, um, people it's expensive to hire people in Australia. What do I want to know? Well, I, what I want to know is the review question for the chapter, which is identify what is involved in managing the downsized workplace. And then students are reading with a purpose. You can get students to write research questions when you're using EAP textbooks, but I find that unless you've embedded that in a larger task that has a an ultimate purpose, it doesn't work so well. So you might have something like this where you've got your KWL table and then you've got your undergraduate business text. So you can see managing the downsized workplace and then there's a table um, with example, examples of Australian companies and then hit the paragraph at the bottom, I've made a big one. Right, so I'm gonna bring back P and I'll show you how to combine KWL and P. So the first paragraph from that business textbook, managerial communication textbook. You can see that the yellow is the P and then there's some E and then a bit of explanation and then it goes back into example again. So the student's gonna use the PEE to find the P um, and they're gonna put the P into what I have learned, right? So what do I know? They write what they know. What do I want to know? They write their research question. And then what I have learned is they write the main idea. So they have to, they're thinking about how do managers manage a downsized workplace. So this is a bit of background. So they're not going to necessarily need that to answer the review question, right? Doesn't answer the research question. So again, P is in yellow, and then we've got example and explanation. So again, the the the, the what they've learned doesn't answer their research question. But this one, identify what is involved in managing a downsized workplace. This one answers the research question. The answer is open and honest communication is critical. Um, managers who have been through downsizing efforts point out the importance of communicating openly and as soon as information is available. So the student's gonna take that point and they're gonna put it in their KWL table like this. So, okay, that student's own handwriting. Many companies get rid of staff when they wanna cut costs. And then the review question and then here, Open and honest communication is essential. That's the point from that paragraph. And then the two following paragraphs, that's the yellow point. So now they've got a summary that actually answers their research question. So it's very good if they have to write a research report and they have a question. Works quite well with that. 
Um, so you want them to find, you've got five, they've got a journal article or five journal articles and they have to use it to support that. Then what you do is you tell them to put the original text away and they're going to write their summary from one, two, three in their table and they're not going to look at the original text. Okay, so I can see that it's, it's almost time to finish up. So I'll just go back through the main points, which is, I think using um, uh, scaffolding, like point evidence explanation example, is a way of breaking down the paragraph. And it's useful, like PE, the simplest one, is very useful for sort of IELTS 4.5, IELTS 5. Um, I think P can help students uh, with attempting heading matching questions and PTE because it helps you to teach them how to separate the difference between main ideas and detail. It gives them a strategy, a basic strategy. And I think if you practice that strategy little and often using pair work, um, they build up automatization when preparing for ISTATS exam. So they can do it under pressure, um, even with more difficult vocabulary. I think for postgraduate and undergraduate bridging courses, uh, KWL tables are a useful strategy um, to, to teach students how to read for a purpose. And that's your higher order thinking skill, is that you're reading for a purpose and then you're summarising that and then you can do something with it. You can make a presentation, you can write a response, you can reflect. Um, and it works quite well if you want to train undergraduates how to read university textbooks effectively, uh, which is a really important reading skill for students going into undergraduate, I think. Um, and I think you can actually combine PE and KWL so that when the students, um, you want them to fill the KWL table, uh, in order to get them to fill in the L, the PEE will support that, especially if they're particularly weak. Because I think it's really important that, you know, when students come out of a reading lesson, um, there's, you know, what, did they, what could they do by the end of the reading class that they couldn't do at the beginning? And to come back to my earlier point about the difference between teaching reading and testing reading is that you ask yourself that question, what could they do at the end of the lesson that they couldn't do at the beginning? And if you can say, well, I taught them to identify like PEE or they learned how to use a KWL table, you can feel like there, were, there was a value added there. So I think you can make your teaching practice more effective um, by using P or KWL, or you can Google any of the similar ones, Teal, Peel. Um, and I think if you use them together with a more authentic EAP task design, critical thinking and reading outcomes will improve and there's more scope for creativity in the classroom. Uh, so thank you for your time. I think that's taken us to half an hour. Um, I have references here uh, if anyone is uh, interested in where I got some of my ideas from. Uh, so thank you, Gabby. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Um, somebody asked a question, which I was going to I was going to actually ask you. Could you could you flick back to the PEE slide right at the beginning, just in case we had people joining oh, us that might might not have seen it. Um, somebody made that point. What, what, what is PEE? So uh, right. Sorry. Back to the beginning. Uh, yes. Right. It. That one. Yeah. Yeah. So it's it, it, yeah. So it looks if you joined late, I apologize. Um, it looks like that in hamburger form, but it looks like that in paragraph form. So the P is the point or the main idea or the topic sentence, and that's the yellow of this particular paragraph. The evidence or the um, explanation is the green part, and then the example is the blue part. So um, it's, a, it's traditionally used or has been used quite a lot as a frame to teach secondary students how to write. And again, you know, that connection between reading and writing that Leckie talks about but um, you can, like, for example, this paragraph that came from Healthline, a lot of paragraphs do actually break into PEE. Um, many don't. You have to kind of be confident with PEE, but it's a good, it's a really good starting point for students who, um, who really struggle with finding the main idea. Okay, that's great. So could you go back to the references, the, the last slide as well, somebody's asked that. And while you're doing that, um, you did mention there was um, 
was it a conversation app? Was it Flick Group or something that you oh, mentioned? Flip Flip Grid. Flick Grid. Okay, Flick Grid. F L I P G R I D. Flip Grid. It's um, it's a really good app for uh, like video. The students upload videos of themselves doing reflections, and um, it's oh, thank got. Thank you, Jim. Somebody's written it in there. Yeah, great. Thank. you. Okay, yeah, in the questions box. Sorry, go on. Yeah, it's it's really um, I'm it's really user friendly, and it has an actual rubric like worked into the function, so you can you can put your feedback into the the rubric in the um, the, the the grid. And I think the best thing about it is that all the videos are sort of within the the app, so they're not mm -hmm. available on the internet. I think they're contained within the app. Uh, but anyway, it, it's very user friendly if you need to get students to, like you want your class to reflect on something they've read in the lesson and you want them to video themselves talking for two minutes reflecting on, um, might be like, for example, with the sugar paragraph and memory reflecting on whether they eat a lot of sugar, does it affect their own memory? Yeah, so it's quite a, a useful app and they can do it on their phone. Great stuff. Yeah. If you have any questions, anybody, please do put them in now. See, people are raising uh, lots of different points, which is good. Um, first question that I had in during the webinar is, um, can the PEE model be applied to different types of reading? Um, different types of reading. What do you mean? I think it works with, I should have said, expository texts. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm not sure it would work with narrative. Okay, and could you recommend for students who have difficulty with the vocabulary when they're reading, do you have any strategies for that? I think you mentioned oh, absolutely. going to their dictionaries yeah. a lot, but anyone that has a bit of an issue with, you know, slowing them down because they don't understand the vocabulary. Yeah, well, I mean, I think that that's a huge issue because I think if you've, you know, read the, about threshold, reading threshold, I think Nation estimates that students need about 3,000 or 3,750 word vocabulary to start engaging with texts and if they are below that they're going to find reading expository texts like the ones I showed difficult. Um, I mean I find that if I have to do it I would for the purposes of, of explaining the PEE or the TEAL I would make sure that I took all of the difficult vocabulary out of that particular text but if I want to teach students um, to you know, to improve their vocabulary. I do find online dictionaries and chunking very useful. Um, so students really need to have a systematic way of recording chunks of vocabulary. Um, some students use notebooks, other students seem to love using Quizlet. I don't know if people are familiar with Quizlet. Um, it's an, another app that's very popular where I work. Um, so, but yeah, it is, it's going to be for any student that has a vocabulary of below about 3,700 words, they really need to work on their vocabulary and not just individual words, but chunks of language and using a, an online dictionary. But I think for the purposes, if you've got like a level, what do you call it, like a, a B1 sort of class, yeah, think very carefully about which text you use to model st structure. Mm. That might lead into the next question as well. It says, how do you um, initiate reading skills um, it, uh, it, into, with, well, sort of with, with un, let's say, unmotivated students? How do you, how do you motivate oh, yeah. the students with the reading? Because this is always a, a motivational question, always pops up. Absolutely. Um, yeah, so that's an excellent question. And uh, I mean, obviously, I think what, like he's saying about reading and writing, um, students need to have a purpose for reading. Um, often if it's just to answer questions in a textbook, they're not going to be very interested. So they have to do something with it. Like they have to retell it to their partner or they have to talk, talk about it in a group. I mean, I know that you often don't have control over the topic, but if you can control the topic, um, I find, like you said earlier, you know, I have an interesting growth mindset. I just find things that students can talk about like growth mindset, you know, which is about um, being afraid to take risks or just a topic like that or the power of positive thinking that they can easily personalise. So they read something and then it's a theory 
Marshmallow test is another example, a theory that they can personalise, they can talk about themselves, their lives. Um, then I think they'll be a bit more motivated to, to read it, um, especially if they know they have to do something with it. Um, so task design, having an ultimate purpose can help. Um, if it's heading, if, you, if you, they're not motivated about doing heading matching questions, gamify it. Um, so, you know, like they've got the, the paragraph and the choices and you put them in teams and the teams have to choose the correct um, answer and then they get points, you know, so you could do it like that if it's exam preparation. Uh, if you're teaching English for academic purposes, try and make it into a ho holistic kind of task. And especially if they can then use an, an app like Flipgrid to, you know, do the final part, they might find that a little bit more interesting. Mm. Uh, another question, how can you, how can you evaluate uh, the students using these models? Evaluate it effectively, yeah, to, to know if they're improving, I guess. Um, to know if they're improving, well, I, you, as I said, I usually measure the outcome by walking around, seeing if, if I give them a paragraph they can highlight or they can locate the, um, the main idea individually or as a team, or if I, I put something in boxes, if they, if they filled in the box, I know they can identify the main idea. That's usually how I evaluate whether or not um, if I give them a paragraph, um, they can find the main idea quickly. Is that the question? How do I evaluate it? I mean, you can, if you're asking me how you would test that, um, how you test main ideas, I think you, if it's a formal test, people use heading matching questions, but um, I think for just in the classroom, just giving them a, a text and asking them individually to underline the main idea of each paragraph would be a very simple way of doing it. Okay, good. and another question here. Um, how do you teach hot reading skills to students with different levels? I think you mentioned the other one was maybe better for the, the higher level students and the PE, you know, you could use it with everybody, but they're, um, they're flexible, I guess. Well, yeah, I mean, the, 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 you can use KWL or P, PE with any any level um, above about sort of IELTS 4.5 because the difficulty is not the PE, the difficulty is the text they're using. So it, it really depends on which text you use. So just remind me what the question was again, how? It says, um, I have a question, how stability. to teach hot reading skills to students with different levels? So different levels in the same class or? It it could be, yeah, it could be. It doesn't say, but um, would you yeah, have I mean, if an it's, answer for that one? Yeah, if you, yeah, I mean, that's a common a common issue, like having different levels in the same class. Um, I mean, I, if I've got different levels in the same class, I always try and build, like, um, extension into the, the task. So, for example, um, I'll have, like, a minimum level that I want most of the class to have achieved. I'll have a very simple first part. So, for example, if I've got like um, some strong readers and some weak readers and I want them to use PE, the weak ones, I might get them, all I want them to do that lesson is to highlight the point, the evidence and the example in a paragraph. And if they can do that, I'm really happy. Um, with the stronger readers, I might that paragraph might be the second paragraph out of a whole text. I might want them to go on, have done four, four of the paragraphs. And then the really strong ones, I might want them to have actually taken those points out and started writing a summary. So I think it's okay to have different students working on the same task, but maybe not necessarily everybody being on the same part of it at the same time. Certainly okay. that was, yeah. Sorry, thank you. I just want to squeeze in as many, there's lots of questions here. Just another oh, quick okay. one here. Um, how many hours should a student deal with reading so they won't get bored or overwhelmed in class? I suppose that's just how, oh. how much do you dedicate to reading? Obviously, that's just no. That's that an excellent question. Well, one thing I I got, came to the conclusion after teaching IELTS for many IELTS courses for many years is that having students doing a lot of text reading in class doesn't really help. Like they they read a really long text. It takes sort of twenty five minutes of class time 
but because and then they do the two false not given questions or the heading matching questions and then they get half of them wrong and then you spend like 30 minutes going through why each one of them is wrong and I didn't know, wasn't really sure whether they'd actually learned anything in the end so that's why I started doing micro reading tasks where I would just like um, I would write 10 true false not given questions for three sentences or I would have like one paragraph two students have one paragraph each and they have to find the main idea of that paragraph find out what's similar or different about their paragraphs and then you know choose the correct heading like very quick that really short activities that really get right to the, the point of what they're doing with exam preparation because I don't think reading um, I think reading a really long text in the in the classroom without a kind of clear learning outcome can use a lot of class time yeah Sure. Okay, I think we've got time for one final one. Do teachers need to provide extensive reading materials to support the course book to teach higher order thinking? Can you recommend some materials? I suppose this is where do you source uh, your your reading from? Yeah, I mean, there, look, I haven't done a lot of research myself on extensive reading, uh, but I, I mainly do. This is really about intensive reading. I mean, I think a lot of research says that extensive reading is highly beneficial and certainly graded readers are quite popular um, where I work. But I mean, if I have to source materials for my class, it really will depend on their destination course. So if they're going into undergraduate business, I'll go and get a managerial communication textbook. If they're doing, um, you know, like IT, I'll go and find a peer reviewed article or a, like an article on web design for them to read, you know, so I try and find things that um, ha because I think the vocabulary and the type of structural language, especially when you're getting up to postgraduate students really is really quite specific. Uh, so I, I try and source it from the destination course uh, for bridging students. Yeah. Okay, I think that's all we've got time for. Um, I'd just like to thank everybody for attending. Thank you very much. We've got a number of people uh, still still on the line and I don't know if you want to say anything, Gabby. Um, I'd just like to really thank everybody for taking half an hour out of their busy day uh, to listen to uh, a webinar about reading skills. I think reading skills are really important and uh, it's great that everybody was interested so thank you lovely and thank you gabby thank you very much indeed so just